If it's Friday, unprecedented expulsion. Tennessee Republicans strip two black Democrats of their seats, but decide to spare their white colleague after all three rallied on the Tennessee House floor for stricter gun laws. Two of the so-called Tennessee Three will be here together in a moment. Plus, taking on Trump, I'll talk to the only Republican presidential candidate who's calling on Trump to drop out of the 2024 race after last week's historic indictment. My one-on-one -on -one interview with Asa Hutchinson, straight ahead. And Israel fires back during the holidays, launching airstrikes in Gaza and southern Lebanon in one of the most significant offenses since 2006. And moments ago, Israel says a terror attack killed one and wounded several others in Tel Aviv. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. Happy Good Friday to those celebrating. I'm Chuck Todd reporting in Washington. It is sad to say, but the unprecedented party line votes to expel two Democratic lawmakers from the Tennessee House of Representatives is a near perfect distillation of the current state of American politics. Polarization, pugilism, political theater, and yes, an undercurrent of racism. Vice President Kamala Harris changed her schedule and is currently on her way to Nashville to meet with Tennessee state legislators. After late yesterday, while protesters shouted from the gallery, the Republican supermajority in the Tennessee State House voted to remove two young black Democrats, Justin Jones and uh, Justin Pierce, for violating rules of decorum. They, along with a third Democrat, Gloria Johnson, led a gun reform protest on the House floor itself last week. It was in violation of House rules. They were immediately punished by being stripped of their committee assignments, by the way, so there was an initial punishment. All of this ha was just days after a mass shooting at a Nashville private school that killed six. Johnson, who was white, survived her vote. And after the vote to remove her failed, an emotional Johnson hugged Jones, who had already been expelled, and spoke directly to the dynamics, or likely dynamics, behind her survival. I just don't, other than me being a white lady, I don't know what else it was. And we're not divided, we're still three. We are still three, Tennessee three. Tennessee Black Caucus called Jones's and Pearson's removal a, quote, miscarriage of justice. This is the greatest miscarriage of justice on this floor uh, since African-American members were first seated after Reconstruction and then after in the Jim Crow era. There is no accountability in this legislature. They are time and time again attacking our cities. Uh, Representative Jones and Representative Pearson just so happen to represent the two most diverse cities in, in Tennessee, Nashville and Memphis. The Congressional Black Caucus also condemned the expulsions in a statement President Biden called the expulsions shocking, undemocratic and without precedent. Sadly, though, if you follow politics, you know a clash like this seems like it was inevitable because it isn't just that we are deeply divided. It's also compromised the ability to have serious debate and it's largely been replaced by political theater because sometimes the system won't even allow for serious debate. In many places, especially in the South, the districts are so gerrymandered that politicians only need to speak to their base. Just look at these numbers. In Tennessee, Trump won the state, which is 60% of the vote. Now, it's significant. It means it's a red state. But do you realize Republicans make up 75% of the state house? So Republicans are over-indexed in the state house. And by the way, half of those Republicans didn't even face an opponent of any stripe. Not an independent, not a Democrat, not any. And by the way, only four faced an opponent where they were held under 60% of the vote. So they're not competitive. It's a similar story in some neighboring states. Missouri, Trump won 56% of the vote. GOP makes up 68% of the state house. It's a bigger percentage of those Republicans, 57%, ran unopposed. No competition at all. Arkansas, Trump won 62% of the vote. It's a whopping 82% of the state house that is Republican. Of course, partisan gerrymandering is a problem all across the country. Some of the bluest states also have even more shocking disparities. Democrats make up an even larger percent of the state house when compared with their share of the statewide vote in California, in Massachusetts, and in Hawaii. And the political careers of Jones and Pearson, of course, are not over. In many ways, the Tennessee Republicans in the House probably just created to longtime political activists that will be in Tennessee politics for a very long time. 
Both of them could end up uh, representing the same seat again. They may get reappointed back to their positions. It's a unique dynamic that Tennessee has when it comes to special elections. But the dynamics that led to this moment are still there. They're there in Tennessee, and they're there across the country. And we've even seen them in Congress. Whether it's Ilan Omar or Marjorie Taylor Greene, none of this is going away. Blaine Alexander is on the ground for us in Nashville right now. And Blaine, it's still sort of shell shocking what happened yesterday. And for me, the real shell shock was when it was so overt uh, of a racial disparity in the decision on, on the expulsions. What are you hearing on the ground? You know, when I spoke with the chairman of the Tennessee Black Caucus, he said that exact same thing. I asked him if he believed that race played a factor in what we saw play out yesterday. He said unequivocally, yes, he does believe that it did. And he said that it was just so egregiously so. So that's why the caucus is really going to rally around its two former members uh, and potentially once again members, uh, should they be reappointed in the days to come. He said that one of their biggest concerns is even if they are reappointed by, uh, you know, their local bodies, making sure that they aren't blocked from taking those seats if they are sent back to the state house. But here's one thing that I want to point out, Chuck. We heard from a Republican lawmaker, somebody who took one of those very closely watched votes. He voted to expel the two members, uh, Jones and Pearson, but did not vote to expel uh, Representative Gloria Johnson. He explained it to our affiliate this way, essentially saying that he believed that what she had done was not as egregious. He said that she didn't take the bullhorn, didn't walk up to the podium and speak on the House floor. Therefore, he said that he believed that she warranted uh, being able to stay in the House while the other two didn't. So that's how he's defending his vote, at least. Uh, certainly Republicans who are involved in this say that it only comes down to what they did on the House floor uh, and they, there wasn't anything about race involved. But what's notable about this, Chuck, I think, is the climate that you described, not just here in Tennessee, but around the country. And that's why the lawmakers that I spoke to today say they are so concerned about what sort of precedent does this set when you look at other states around the country that could possibly try and follow a similar pattern well Blaine I'm curious it looks quiet today is everybody taking a good Friday break uh, and we should expect these protests back next week yeah. Absolutely expect them back next week. Uh, the Capitol is closed today. There's no session because it is Good Friday. But yes, they've already called. Uh, a number of the lawmakers have called for people to come back on Monday. We've heard from some people that may be even trying to come from out of town to join them. The other thing that we're watching for very closely, Chuck, is that the Metro Council here in Nashville is going to hold a special meeting to vote on filling the absence that was left by Representative Jones. Mm -hmm. And already a number of them have said that they want to put him right back in that seat. So it's possible that he could be back in his seat by sometime Monday night or even Tuesday morning, Chuck. Well, I'm going to be talking to him right now. Uh, all right, Blaine Alexander uh, on the ground first in Nashville. Blaine, thank you. I'm joined now by two of the, th of the Tennessee Three, current State Representative Gloria Johnson, and now perhaps just temporarily former State Representative Justin Jones. And, and Gloria Johnson, I'm going to start with you. I know um, you're, you're a bit mobile right now, and I get that. So um, <laughs> let me ask this question this way. Look, thinking back, was this an inevitable clash that was coming inside this House of Representatives? Yes, I believe that it was. The fact that we, our voices are very often silenced on the floor. Our, mic, our mics are cut. We are not called on. Uh, we had no opportunity and were even gaveled down when we tried to acknowledge the protesters who were there, the moms and the toddlers and the teenagers who are there begging us to do something, begging us to do something um, and, and to take real action. And I, I talked to them and I listened to them that morning crying about the fear they had while dropping their kids off at school. So Is we had, we felt compelled in our hearts, mm -hmm. all of us to speak. Is there something about the rules in the Tennessee House that make it almost easier to get stepped on the way uh, you and the Tennessee Three have been stepped on here? Well, it's it's the supermajority, the fact that they really don't even have to allow us to talk and they are able to pass any rules. And so this year they passed a rule that uh, we only have five minutes that we can debate. And then of that five minutes, if I ask a question that takes 30 seconds, they might read the bill or um, take up the rest of the four and a half minutes just by reading the bill or talking nonsense. And and so we are being silenced so often on incredibly important legislation and incredibly important discussions 
like gun sense. It's just horrifying that we are there. We represent 70,000 people each in our districts, and we are there to lift their voices, yeah. and we're not given the opportunity. Justin Jones, members of the Tennessee Black Caucus say you've been, that they have, that since you took office, that they have been fielding complaints about you being mistreated. Uh, you tell me, how have you, how have you felt serving from day one? And, and have you been essentially made to feel unwelcome? Yes, yeah, um, I think it's the Tennessee legislature is a very toxic work environment for anyone who does not fit the the image that they want to portray. Um, you know, being a young um, black lawmaker, being 27 years old, um, and someone who is outspoken for my district, that's the reason why I was elected. Um, from day one, you know, I was told, I think someone said it yesterday when during our, our fake trial, they said, you, you didn't become one of us. Um, and, and, I, I, and I take pride in that, is that what we are seeing is a body that is so drunk with power that not only were they silencing us, but they're silencing the 78,000 people who we represent. Um, they're silencing the, those young people who can't even vote yet, many of them, but who are saying, we want to live. We want to be free from this terror of mass shootings. Let's ban assault weapons. And what do the Republican supermajority do? They assault democracy. And I saw what we're dealing with is a body that is dealing, that traffics in, in the rhetoric of racism and that traffics in these anti-democracy attacks that harm us all. Uh, let me ask a, a, a more basic question about, so the shooting happens. You're a state representative here, um, Justin. And you're trying to have a conversation about an assault weapon ban. And you probably knew that the numbers were the numbers. But explain to me how they stifled the debate, right, where you couldn't even sort of, all right, can we at least have a debate to you talk about the merits and I'll talk about the merits? I mean, we are not a deliberative body. We are not a democratic body. And so even in something as basic as welcoming and honoring portion of our agenda, where we want to welcome those who are in the gallery, these young people, mm -hmm. um, who are, with the thousands who showed up to protest, that's what I wanted to do. Um, that was cut off. Our microphones were cut off. Um, you know, when I went outside to stand in solidarity with the protesters, I came back inside in my, in my machine to press my vote as a lawmaker was cut off by the speaker who, who made an announcement that we could not do that anymore. Though that I never heard that before. Was that a rule? And Did so, you know about this rule before then? No, this has never been enforced. Members mm -hmm. go, to the, to go to the snack room, they go to the bathroom, they come in and out, and, they, and I've never seen a voting machine turned off. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, they, they do everything in their power to silence debate because it is about, a, because they don't want to take accountability. And so, you know, what we saw in committee, we were gaveled down, and, and it's about so many issues, but this is the most grotesque because, you know, I represent a part of, I represented a part of Nashville, and our community's grieving, yeah. our community's mourning, there's trauma here from this, this mass shooting that six precious lives were taken. And we're not even allowed to express the outrage, the hurt, the grievances of our community and the call for action. But instead, we're just offered moments of silence. That's all that they allowed us I, to do I, and pray. I mean, Justin, I'm sitting here, you know, a lot of people would say, well, if you really want to do something about a problem, run for office. Well, that's what you've done. You ran for office. You won office. And what you're saying to me is you're not allowed to express your opinion or your district's opinion in office, in the body you were elected to, to be in. Exactly. I mean, that is that is how extreme anti-democracy forces have become, particularly here in a state like Tennessee, where they, they feel like because of gerrymandered uh, maps and, and voter suppression that they're in power, but they don't represent the interests of the majority of Tennesseans. And so what do they do is they try mm -hmm. and limit discussion. They try and limit what we can advocate for because they're afraid that it will hold up a mirror to their false power. And so, um, I mean, I, I ran for office as someone who spent 10 years doing community organizing. I, I was one of the youngest lawmakers, the youngest black right. lawmaker, trying to represent my generation. And they, and they told me that you know, basically that I'm uppity, that, you know, that you need to humble yourself. I, I said, I'm not coming here as an intern. I'm coming here as a legislator, yeah. a, a colleague, an equal. Boy, that's a, a lot of, a lot of African-Americans of another generation were described that way in the 1960s, Justin, is that just speaking out, oh, you're uppity or you're this or you're that. Let me ask you this. You were, uh, and as you said, you were an activist. You were well known to folks in that Nashville, in, in Nashville, during the 20, do you think your activism is why you were specifically targeted for expulsion? The fact that they, you were a known activist before you even got into office. 
Definitely. I mean, that is what got me into office was that the community knew I, I was a fighter, that I would speak up. But that is what's threatening to our majority. They, they are used to people who will bow down to them. There's only three of us who went in that well that day, myself, Representative Johnson, Representative Pearson. We're the only ones who went to that well mm -hmm. because we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Others could join, but we, we stood up because we, this has gone on for far too long right. and we could not be silent anymore. And so the, the, the body is, is afraid of voices of dissent. They're afraid of voices of opposition. They're used to just having their way. They call themselves the majority and us the minority, but not, we're not that. We are the check on power. We are the dissenting voice, uh, the, the voice of moral dissent, and we are upholding our oath to the state constitution to challenge any decision or law that is injurious to the people. That's what we were doing that day. Well, and remember, the founders were always about trying to protect minority rights in a deliberative body, and this is a case where the Tennessee House is not doing that. Um, Gloria, you were very clear that you believe race was the only reason why you're still a, uh, currently a member of the state house. Uh, have you heard from any of these Republican members that have, I'm just curious, either behind the scenes that have said, man, well, maybe we went too far. Gosh, how did we get to here? Is there any regret that anybody's expressing? Not from any elected members. I've heard it from Republicans back home, um, you know, but they but I've I sort of heard, you know, oh, well, they didn't show enough contrition or something like that. But but I didn't either. But <laughs> I'm a white woman. Yeah. And I think, you know, the younger generation, they're so passionate about what they're doing and they're so smart and uh, just prepared for this moment. And I think that's frightening to some of the older folks and certainly to the conservative folks. And I just say we should embrace it because these these two young men's voices are so powerful mm -hmm. and so important to the Tennessee legislature. We've got to do everything we can to get them back. Is there anything you can be doing about gerrymandering? Gloria, I mean, it, it's such a it's a massive problem that I don't know if a, an individual state can do anything about it unless they choose to prioritize competition. Well, actually, we're about to have a lawsuit about our maps and we're pretty sure we're going to win it. Yeah. So um, looking forward to that coming up. Yeah. I mean, they did they did draw me out of our district, out of my district, just my block they drew out of my precinct. So. <laughs> Um, hopefully, we're going to get some comeuppance here pretty soon. And, Justin, uh, it's, it appears, and I, again, people out, outside of Tennessee may not realize that the, they, they can, you can get reappointed back to the seat before the special election. A couple of things. Will you accept the appointment? And if you do, um, do you expect to be seated? Um, and do you plan to file a lawsuit anyway? Because I do think there's some questions about the constitutionality of all this. Yes, I definitely, you know, would be honored to continue to fight for my district because th what's happening now is that there are 78,000 people in one of the most diverse districts in Tennessee that don't have a voice on Capitol Hill in District 52 because of the extreme retaliation of this Republican supermajority. And so, you know, I, I look forward to, um, you know, look if the council would reappoint me but no matter what i know that there's a special election and so we'll continue to organize continue to speak up and whether i'm inside or outside the chamber i will always stand with the people um i think that you know the next steps are really about getting seated are really in the hands of the speaker mm -hmm. um who who has already shown that he is not a fan of democracy and so we'll see if you know if if i am reappointed if i you know run in the special election right. if the speaker will appoint me but there's a case a supreme court case where julian bond they refuse to seat him a young man and when he in the, in the civil rights movement yep. and he took it all the way to the Supreme Court and won. Yep. No, uh, you have, uh, it's an important history lesson. It's a reminder. History doesn't always repeat, but it sure rhymes. Gloria Johnson, mm -hmm. Justice, Justin Jones, thank you both for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Coming up, national Republicans have been largely silent on the moves by the Tennessee Republican legislature. I'm going to talk to Asa Hutchinson about that and a whole lot more. He's, of course, the former governor of Arkansas and soon to be officially announced candidate for president. Plus, China imposes some new sanctions on the United States, just as another bipartisan group of lawmakers defies Beijing's warnings and prepares to meet with the tiny Taiwanese president, this time in Taiwan. That's ahead. Welcome back. While former President Trump's Manhattan indictment sucked up just about all of the air in the 2024 presidential primary narrative this week, he is, of course, not the only candidate on the campaign trail. In fact, the 2024 field actually got bigger this week. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson became the latest candidate to 
essentially announced that he'll be announcing he's, he's uh, going to be a candidate in uh, officially on April 18th. Hutchinson spent two terms as the governor of Arkansas. And before that, he served in the Bush administration as the Under Secretary of Homeland Security, head of the DEA. Before that, he was a member of Congress. And before that, he was a U.S. attorney in Arkansas. He's one of the deepest resumes of anybody uh, running for president. And Governor Hutchinson joins me now. Governor, it's good to see you. Good to be with you, Chuck. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it's a different backdrop. Is that a New Hampshire backdrop that I, that I have you on already? <laughs> no, this is a Bentonville, Arkansas backdrop. Oh, it's Bentonville, Arkansas. Okay, that's what it is. It's not the normal Little Rock uh, background. Let me start with what's happening with your neighbors there to the east in Tennessee. Um, good look or bad look for the Republican Party right now? Well, I would... Uh, one, I'm not going to get in and judge what's happening in the state legislature in Tennessee. Uh, we have a General Assembly in Arkansas, and while I was governor, you know, they governed their own conduct. They had to make tough decisions, and so that's a legislative matter, and that's in Tennessee. But from the bigger picture, though, it just reflects that it's really important that we try to bridge gaps to work together. I mean, here you've got a lot of emotion coming out of the uh, Nashville a school shooting, which was such a tragedy. There's emotion there. You've got a legislative session going on. I know that whenever we had the uh, George Floyd uh, protest in Arkansas and across the nation, uh, there was it turned to violence. So we stopped the violence. Then I brought the uh, protest leaders in, put them on a task force. Uh, with some law enforcement and said, let's see if we can't uh, figure out some things together. And it was a very productive thing that led to action. So I think listening to each other uh, is, is critically important and trying to find common ground where we can. That's to me how you try to get over this divide. So it sounds like you, what you think is the Tennessee leadership uh, went too far in, exp in expelling these members for, ha I mean, again, they're advocating Whatever you think of their position, they're caring about people who got hurt and died. Like, that's what makes this seem so callous, Governor, is that, you know, how dare you have an emotional outburst reacting to somebody who died? I, you know, it's not, it's inhumane. Well, I haven't seen the uh, videotapes. I haven't seen the protests and how that uh, might have interrupted the decorum or violated the rules of the Senate. So I just can't judge that. Why, why, uh, I, why so, not? I mean, you're running to be president of the United States, Governor. I understand if you're still governor of Arkansas. And I get it. You know, look, hey, that's their territory. You're running to be leader of the entire Republican Party. You're running to set a tone. To, and, and, and look, I, I, I commend you for the tone you, you said. Look, I, I, and you're right. You didn't have the same issues that other governors had because you've not been pugilistic. You don't look at the other side and think, well, I'm going to just mute them. But that's my point here. You're also, though, not addressing the issue either. You, you kind of want to have to sit back. Why? Well, because I don't think that, uh, uh, you know, every national leader needs to comment on what's happening in Tennessee. You know, if, uh, if it becomes a national issue and concern, yes. But uh, I view this as something that uh, is a Tennessee legislative issue. It's obviously a very serious thing any time you uh, take uh, the elected representative away from the people who voted for them. It's a most serious consequence that you can have. I just can't judge right now. If I had to, I'll look at all the tapes, and if, at the right time, I might make a judgment on it. But I think it's inappropriate for me to uh, second guess uh, what happened in Tennessee at this point. Look, one of the ways that we frame this, and and I and I is the. The fact that this felt sadly inevitable. It happened to be Tennessee, but I think we know we've got this partisan gap that, it, that has gotten widened and, and, and wider. And a lot of it has to do with gerrymandering. I mean, your state is, is one of the examples. You know, Trump won the state with 62 percent of the vote. I believe you won with about 63, 64 percent. Basically, the state is a 65-35 split, okay, generally, give or take. The state house is 82 percent Republican. More uh, half of them don't even get an opponent. Uh, have we gone? Do you do you think this has gone too far? That it's it's we're getting legislatures that are essentially over indexed to one party and therefore not accountable to the people. 
Uh, well, I would agree with you uh, on the point that uh, we've tried to protect incumbents to a great extent. Uh, we've tried to make red districts more red, blue districts more blue. Uh, both sides have played that game because, it, and, and here's the challenge that everybody would rather uh, worry about the general election and having uh, a safe run there versus having a contest uh, in the primary. And so you're trying to make it more red, and then that, that really changes uh, uh, your ability to work together because you're constantly appealing more to the base versus worrying about getting votes in a general election. That impacts us nationally. I think from a Republican standpoint, we need to have a nominee in 2024 that can appeal to independents and suburban voters if you're going to win. So there is some national application there. Look, you're, you're actually, it's exactly, I, I, I believe, for instance, that the party's disconnect on abortion has to do with the fact that most of the people making this decision don't have to, don't get challenged from the other side. There's only one point of view. If you only worry about Republican primary, it's how pro-life are you, right? And you're, you're not even speaking to the middle. Do you think that that has, why it looks like the Republicans look so out of touch on this issue? Well, I think the abortion question is really a matter of conviction and, and uh, sincere beliefs on both sides. And so that's sometimes hard to bridge the divide naturally. Uh, but uh, whenever you look at other issues, sure, the first requirement is listen, uh, beat together, uh, hold to your principles, but there's always some common ground that you can try to find. And, uh, and so we need to do more of that versus less. Uh, but the pro-life issue is something that uh, it's going to take more time yeah. uh, to, uh, you know, change from uh, the strong pro-life position that the Republicans have. Yeah. It's sincerely held by myself and others. I, and it, that gets me to something here. A politician is often fond of saying, I don't pay attention to the polls, on one hand. On the other hand, you are responsible to what the people want. Abortion is a perfect example. You have a 60 to 65 percent majority that wants essentially Roe v. Wade, some form of that. Um, it's only 36 percent of all Republicans. If you're president of the United States, how responsive do you think you should be to what 65% of the country wants versus maybe what 65% of your own party wants? Well, we all do study polls, uh, <laughs> and it is a relevant conversation uh, because it helps you to guide as to what uh, Americans are thinking. Uh, but, you know, on this issue, uh, you know, you come at it from different points of view, and it's just going to take time for our country to sort through it. Well, uh, 40 years, our country has become more pro-life because of education, because of science. You know, the debate now has centered on really two things. Uh, one, the Supreme Court said it's up to the states, and our states vary. You've got blue states that have one view viewpoint and red states that have a different, more conservative viewpoint on the uh, unborn child issue and the protections there. Uh, and the other one is are the exceptions. These are going to be ongoing debates within the framework of what the Supreme Court has given us that it's up to the states and there's some debate about whether you ought to have a national standard. I believe that uh, the states uh, is what we fought for for years, that it ought to come back to them. I think that's helpful for our states to be able to make that determination even though they might be different. It reflects the will of the people on the most serious health care issues. Governor Hutchinson. There's a lot to talk about throughout this campaign. One of the things about you I know is you're not afraid to say yes and talk about these issues on the air. I look forward to covering your campaign, sir, and good luck and be safe on the trail, will you? All right. Thank you, Chuck. Good you to be with it. you. Up next, as both parties set their sights on 2024, and President Biden gears up for an official re-election campaign at some point, new polls show more than half of Democrats would prefer somebody else be the nominee than Joe Biden. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Vice President Kamala Harris is on her way to the State House in Nashville, Tennessee to meet with Democratic lawmakers 
uh, the day after two state representatives were expelled from the chamber by the Republican supermajority. Joining me now, Eugene Scott, senior politics reporter at Axios, Jen Psaki, the former White House press secretary and host of Inside with Jen Psaki, Sundays on MSNBC, and Daniel Pletka, the senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Eugene, this story is... is uh, I'm going to feed off of something Governor Hutchinson said. Is this a story that is about Tennessee, or is it about something bigger? Mm -hmm. It's about something bigger, which is why last night uh, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Stephen Hartsford, who's from Nevada, mm -hmm. had a meeting with the CBC, which is people outside of Tennessee, and actually black lawmakers from states across the country to figure out what they are going to do, because there's real fear that this is not going to end in Tennessee. And one of the things that Horsford did uh, today was send a letter uh, to Mayor Garland to see if some Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. violations were violated. So this is way bigger than Tennessee. Danny, the premise I started with at the top is that, yes, this happened in Tennessee. This feels like this has been something that was going to happen somewhere in these state houses that we're getting. First of all, the state legislatures are suddenly more relevant because they've had some hot button issues, particularly abortion and guns. Gerrymandering is more extreme at the state house level. It, it, it was Tennessee this time. It could have easily been Missouri. It could have easily been Florida. It could have easily been, you know, California They're in the reverse with the way it is. Or do you see something else here? No, it's not that I see something else, but I do see something bigger going on. I'm not sure I see the exact same thing that you see. We've become a country where you, instead of doing what you should do, you do what you can do. Should they have done this? They're within their rights. They had a vote. It was a democratic vote. It was done properly. They expelled them. Should they have done that? I don't think so. Uh, Alvin Bragg. Should he have brought mm -hmm. those charges against Donald Trump? Well, he could, mm -hmm. and he did, and he did it within his rights. Should he have done it? I'm not sure. We've become a country that no longer talks about whether choices are, are the right choices to make. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that goes for Republicans, it goes for Democrats, it goes for you and me, it goes for all of us. It is something that we were talking about. It does feel like that nobody ever thinks, well, maybe I can do this, but Sir, should I pull back? Should I take a breath? What do you think? What do well, you think this means? What do you? What do you I see? mean, I think they're very different circumstances. Targeting a district attorney who's now received hundreds of threats and is just carrying out justice, which, by the way, is his obligation, is very different from voting to expel legislators who are elected by their people. But I will say, on the point of like, how do you decide what to do and what not to do? I mean. The Republicans in Tennessee just elevated these two state legislators who, by the way, happen to be incredibly passionate, powerful, and are now on the national scene talking about mm -hmm. gun violence and the threats right. to children. That is not what they intended. So in a crazy way, as horrible as what happened yesterday was, it has backfired and has now elevated an issue yeah. that they didn't want to be talking about, the, the Republicans the, who expelled them. The Obi-Wan Kenobi effect. If you strike yeah, exactly. me down, I become more powerful. Exactly. Than you. I, you know, it does feel, this, this comes to this larger question that I've also had, which is, it's just been a... It's not good for the Republican brand. This is not, it doesn't matter. And especially when the outcome was they ousted the two black lawmakers and they didn't out. I mean, that was, you're like, no, they didn't, right? Yeah. It was one of those, you're like, really? I don't know how one could look at this and think that this will expand your party uh, with, of course, obviously with black people, but with the young voters, the kids who were there hoping that the action that these lawmakers would take would be actually about gun violence. You know, I don't know what the thought behind this was that made them think that this would be a winsome approach to this. Well, this is what I wonder, Danny, is that, and this is the other concern I have, is that when you cocoon yourself, whether it's via the gerrymandering process, right, you cocoon yourself from competition, it's the information ecosystem you may, that they don't even realize how bad this might look to the broader picture here. Uh, it, it, you say something that I was just talking about on our on our podcast because there was a poll that came out last week in the Wall Street Journal that showed these vast uh, drops off in patriotism in in uh, wanting to have children mm -hmm. in community service in all these things the only thing that really went up was uh, the importance of money and <laughs> uh, you know, but it, the poll itself was was flawed but one of the reasons we were talking about it is because this is a reflection of how divided things are in this country the perception though uh, of division is really mostly among us. 
other people, whether it's black Americans or it's Hispanic Americans or it's non-college educated white people, they actually, they actually don't feel strongly one way or the other. But none of us meet anybody different. These folks in Tennessee, they're not meeting anybody different. They don't see anybody different to talk to. They should have talked to the people who were demonstrating, for sure. But their constituents see this as a battle to the death. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the problem for all of us. And it's not a Republican problem mm -hmm. or a Democrat problem. It's an American problem. It's something we all need to figure out. Because if you think you're cocooned and nobody's going to judge you for it, you're right. But of course, that's not how it's going to work out. No, this is where, and I don't know how to do this, but I wish we could prioritize competition when it comes to drawing lines. That, mm -hmm. that, you know, that you take and say you can't use the average of the statewide totals with governor's races. So that, because if you don't prioritize competition, then you, you, you're never, I always There's say. There's so few that's house what races. ranked choice voting does, yeah, by that, the way. That was mm -hmm. what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And, and ranked right choice voting now is like outlawed in the state of Idaho and mm -hmm. other states are trying to do this. Yeah, Jen. exactly. I mean, yeah. it, 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 that's why we're only talking about how many competitive races every year, well, right? Well, we saw that the Cook Report did this beautiful analysis about how from 1999, basically the last 25 years, it's getting cut in half. Mm. The number of competitors. Right, and That's just on the congressional level. And we're less gerrymandered there today than we have been in 10 years ago. Right, and it takes away the incentive of working together on things because working together on things has become kind of a dirty, dirty term. Compromise is dirty. Can you win, win re-election doing that? Compromising? Yeah. I actually think in some ways you can, but Joe you Biden can't. Joe Biden can, but not, I, not a legislator. Not a I? legislator. Uh, you can't win Twitter. Right. Yeah. Um, you can, may not be able to win a primary. That's also a problem. Um, but also we do talk a lot more about where and I'm not talking about Tennessee. I'm talking about in general. I mean, Biden passed 80. There were 81 bipartisan bills his first year in office. Right. That's actually, uh, actually pretty good do it in the reverse. The only way you get anything done in Congress is if you can you have to. create the bipartisan. Yes, don't let the, right. the, the perfect be the enemy yeah. of the good. But that's not an easy way to run in a primary. It's not an right. easy way to win a competitive primary. And that's a part of the system that is... And that's not okay. who shows up to vote anymore. Of course. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is the other one. You now I want to pivot off of something else, because this is, if you were to... The, the other huge story of the week was the Wisconsin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. result. Um, the numbers that are shocking to me that should really... Uh, sober up some Republican strategists. One is Dane County. Mm -hmm. Madison is the second largest city in the state. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee County is the largest county in the largest city. Mm -hmm. Dane County produced more voters than Milwaukee County did. Mm -hmm. Here's second fact number two for you, Eugene. The Republican or the conservative candidate, Dan Kelly, got 200,000 more votes mm -hmm. than the last successful conservative Supreme Court candidate in, 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 in Wisconsin mm -hmm. about three years earlier. Mm -hmm. They had a massive surge of young voters, yeah. and they all voted one way. Yeah. And, and if this keeps going, Republicans have a huge problem. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, we've seen this in you know, the last midterm election, the last presidential election. So it's not like Republicans haven't noticed a trend. Mm -hmm. uh, they just haven't gotten behind just how fast this trend is moving away from them. And when you put something like abortion rights on the ballot and, and propose very strict uh, restrictions mm -hmm. on it. Uh, that is motivating to a lot of young people who fear that their rights could be, you know, eradicated. Danny, when you look at the polls, it seems obvious that they've got to, Republicans got to move on this. But is the infrastructure of the conservative movement so tied into the pro-life movement that they don't know how to get out of this box yet? I don't know the answer to that, Chuck. <laughs> I, I honestly don't. I, I think that the Republican Party has had a very hard time absorbing the lessons of the last six years. And if that continues to be the case, the people are going to explain to them what that <laughs> results in. <laughs> and that's, look, that's what we that's saw what in Wisconsin. That's what democracy is supposed to do, actually. That's what we saw in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't, you don't have to give up your convictions. That's the thing. And that's when I listened to Governor Hutchison. I was like, well, you don't, you don't have to give up your convictions, but you do actually have to compromise. You have to understand that there are views on the other side and you have to work towards explaining. You cannot simply judge, not on one mm -hmm. side or the other. Very quickly, go. I was going to say the mechanics of it, because I know these numbers are probably in your head somewhere. Mm -hmm. The early vote numbers mm -hmm. were also a warning to Republicans right. because that was such a big success story in an election that the Democrats were supposed to do so mm -hmm. poorly in. And this was, again, a success story for them in this election. Republicans haven't quite figured out how to do that. Uh, and, and this is something that your friends at AEI would love. But there is this larger issue that as Trump has remade the party into a working class party and sort of lost the college educated crowd, he is 
made it impossible for conservatives to win an off-year election. Yeah. And it's a fascinating problem. Wisconsin has been uh, ground zero of this example over the last three years. Again, like I said, some of your data nerd friends at AEI. I see fact. it. All right. Eugene, Jen, Danny, thank you all. And thank you for humoring me on that little data nerd point. Mm -hmm. After the break, we got some breaking news in Tel Aviv. Israeli police are now reporting one person killed, several wounded, in what the government is calling a terror attack. Just hours after Israel had to launch airstrikes in Lebanon and Gaza. It's a holiday weekend. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. Tensions in the Middle East sadly show no sign of easing even during this important holiday weekend. Just in the last hour, Israel's foreign ministry says one person was killed and several others were injured after a vehicle hit several pedestrians in Tel Aviv. The government is calling it a terror attack. All of this comes after Israel launched retaliatory, retaliatory strikes today on Gaza as well as on Lebanon. That is the biggest airstrike on Lebanon from Israel in 17 years. Raf Sanchez is on the ground in Jerusalem now, and, and I guess we should be thankful that this happened in Tel Aviv and not Jerusalem, or uh, how, because how, I know everybody's been on, uh, on a knife's edge on Jerusalem right now as well. Yeah, Chuck, I mean, from the Israelis' perspective, this is just extraordinarily grim wherever it's happening. This attack in Tel Aviv happened on the promenade along the beach there. It's a popular place for both Israelis and tourists to walk, especially after the sun goes down. And Israeli police are now saying that all the victims of this attack in Tel Aviv were tourists. It appears that the attacker rammed his car into the promenade. He was then shot and killed by Israeli police officers. And, Chuck, this all comes just a couple of hours after two Israeli sisters were killed in an ambush in the occupied West Bank. Their mother was also shot. She is in critical condition in the hospital tonight. She is fighting for her life. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making a kind of unusual visit to the scene of that attack, warning Israel that this country's enemies are once again testing it. Chuck. Raf, this weekend, how do you see a presence, extra presence of security given? I mean, there was, we know that there was some concern that tensions could actually rise with Passover and Ramadan and Easter all converging. Yeah, Chuck, I think what we've seen over the course of the day here is the violence shifting from kind of the macro. If you'd asked me last night, what we were really worried about was another war between Israel and Hezbollah up on the Lebanese border. That situation does appear to have quieted down over the course of the day. It seems that both the Israelis and the Palestinian militants in Lebanon feel like they kind of made their points and that they can back down. What we are now seeing is this wave of attacks inside Israel and in the occupied West Bank. And this is a cycle that just nobody has any good answers to, including Netanyahu and his far-right government, who, Chuck, were elected on a promise to restore security, to be really tough on the Palestinians. And aside from just the pure horror of the attacks, they have a major political problem now that they really do not seem to have any solutions to these wave of attacks that have been continuing not just in the last 24 well, hours, but over previous weeks. And Rob, part, part of this is, a, is that there really isn't a leadership on the Palestinian side that has, is able to stop these things, correct? Isn't that the concern? Yeah, absolutely. So the Palestinians deeply divided in the yeah. occupied West Bank. There's the Palestinian Authority, which is funded, propped up by the United States, but led by this aging leader. It is an organization with really very little credibility among the Palestinian people. Yep. And then, of course, in Gaza, you have Hamas. Chuck. Raf Sanchez on the ground in Jerusalem. Raf, as please stay safe for the entire crew there uh, and enjoy the holiday weekend as best you can. Still to come, bipartisan support of Taiwan is on full display this week, even as U.S.-China tensions spiral. I spoke to one of the House lawmakers who met with the president of Taiwan about what's next for relations with Beijing. That interview is next. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. And what might be described actually as a pretty tepid response by the Chinese, they announced that they're going to slap a few sanctions on two U.S. institutions. They're sanctioning the Reagan Presidential Library and the Hudson Institute because they played the role of hosting and facilitating Speaker Kevin McCarthy's meeting with Taiwan's president earlier this week. Of course, that action is largely a symbolic move. 
uh, and actually may be kind of toothless here, and it may be their way of trying to de-escalate. Earlier, though, I spoke with Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton, who's from Massachusetts. He was a part of that meeting in California, and I began by asking him if this week's meeting was the beginning of preparing for a wartime alliance with Taiwan. Frankly, the first thing to understand is that what happened yesterday is not unusual at all. We have regular meetings uh, with our Taiwanese counterparts. President Tsai has been to the United States, I think, half a dozen times uh, since she's been in office. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we talk to other allies in the Western Pacific and all around the globe on a regular basis. What's really unusual and different here is the fact that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to threaten and intimidate uh, not only Taiwan's officials, but American officials as well for just conducting this routine diplomacy. I, I understand. I, I get that uh, on one hand. But look, tensions are pretty high. Um, and th these meetings are happening simultaneous with a congressional delegation that's on the island right now. Uh, I think we'll be meeting with President Tsai when she gets back to the island. What message should China and the Chinese Communist Party take away from these events? The Chinese Communist Party needs to understand that our alliance is strong and it's, and it's getting stronger. And, of course, it's getting even stronger, largely in response to the Chinese Communist Party's threats. Tensions are high because Xi Jinping uh, addressed the nation, addressed his nation, and said that he intends to invade Taiwan. Uh, that's why tensions are high. It's not anything that we're doing. But in response to that, we're showing that our alliance with Taiwan is strong. Uh, we're shoring up our alliances with other allies in the Western Pacific. You just see, uh, saw a, a major agreement with the Philippines, uh, ushered in by the Biden administration. So we're standing firm and standing mm -hmm. strong and making it clear to China and the Chinese Communist Party that they're not just going to roll over Taiwan uh, as they seemed intent right. to do. It seems militarily we're prepared to defend Taiwan. And I, we, we can argue about whether we have everything we need today to defend Taiwan. But just the different actions of diff that there is a, ur a willingness and an urgency to be prepared if this became a hot war. But it seems the bigger vulnerability, and it sounds like President Tsai believes, the bigger vulnerability is essentially uh, cyber influence, if you will. You know, almost uh, hacking, you know, misinformation and undue influence in their politics that maybe gets a more Chinese Communist Party friendly government. What can the U.S. do about that? Well, it's a great question. And, and just to be clear, all the things that we're doing, uh, whether it's strengthening economic partnerships or building up the military deterrent on the island of Taiwan, it's all to prevent a war. It's all to deter a war. And we ta talked about how we need to accelerate weapons deliveries to Taiwan. That's something President Tsai asked us to do in the meeting. But we spent even more time talking about strengthening our economic partnership. Uh, she raised the possibility of doing a trade deal with Taiwan so that our economies have greater exchanges. And she said that having those solid partnerships, mm -hmm. both between the United States and Taiwan, and then also between Taiwan and other uh, countries that are allies of ours in the Western Pacific, that that is an economic deterrent to China's aggression as well. How concerned, though, is, is President Tsai about the fact that their biggest economic export, arguably these uh, computer chips, is an industry we're trying to build here in this country, essentially just in case we lose Taiwan as a partner? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that she sees this as a, as a good partnership. Uh, the, Taiwan's not moving all its production to the United States, not even close. But they already have a production facility outside of Beijing. So why would they have a production facility outside of Beijing and not will have one in the United States? Uh, she thinks that's an important strategic partnership that, uh, that she should have, and we obviously agree. How does she view the war in Ukraine and how it impacts her in Taiwan? I think all eyes are on the, the war in Ukraine and the lessons uh, that we need to take for that from, from war in Ukraine uh, to, the, to the Pacific. I think one of the most important things to recognize is the strength of our allies and the fact that so many allies have come together to support Ukraine. That's why we're strengthening those allies, those partnerships in the Western Pacific. But another important lesson to take away, as well as this war is going for us in Ukraine, is that ultimately deterrence failed. We're at war today because we were not successful at deterring Putin from invading. And that's something we don't want to repeat uh, in the Western Pacific. So 
That's why we, it's so important that we do this work today. We don't want a strong mm. alliance to come together after China invades Taiwan. We want it to be very clear to Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party that that alliance exists today, and that's why they shouldn't invade. What, what did she, what was her take on what public opinion is on Taiwan between full independence, relationship with Beijing, uh, or, or something else? Well, one of the interesting points uh, that, that she's made, and I've, I heard her make this point uh, when I was in Taiwan and uh, leading a delegation there in October, is that the Hong Kong situation really changes everything for the, for the Taiwanese people. Because for a long time, they believed that they could seek some accommodation with China, uh, perhaps one country, two systems, exactly what they promised Hong Kong. But of course, We've seen the reality of that for Hong Kong. It's one system, one system, one, one control, absolute control from Beijing. So that, I think, really uh, made the, the Taiwanese people, and certainly many of Taiwan's leaders say, that's not going to work, and we're going to have to defend and, and pre prevent China from actually taking over. Uh, I want to ask you a quick question about Afghanistan. We know there's more after-action reports that Congress wants to dig into. The White House has released something. We expect something from the Pentagon today as well. I'll be honest, I read the White House report and it had a lot of President Trump in it, meaning they were essentially saying, look, we, we know that the withdrawal itself looked chaotic, but it, uh, part of that reason was our hands were tied by all these agreements. Is that the right tone and attitude to take? Um, is that fair? I mean, it comes across defensive. Maybe that, those are the facts. What say you? Well, look, it, it's not wrong that Trump did a lot of bad things that set our Afghanistan policy in a terrible direction, but there are a lot of bad things Trump uh, did that the Biden administration wasted no time undoing. So I'm not sure it's entirely fair to say that our, our hands were permanently tied. Were they tied? Yes. But could we have undone them? Mm -hmm. I think we could have. I, I saw the New York Times headline that just said that uh, one of the conclusions is that we should have started the evacuation earlier. That's something I was asking the administration to do for months, both behind the scenes and in public. I hope we learn some lessons from that mistake. Uh, Congressman Seth Moulton, Democrat from Massachusetts, think, again. Thank you. Appreciate you. And that does it for us this hour. I'll be back Monday with more. Uh, we'll, we'll be back Monday with more Meet the Press now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.